Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's good to see you all. Hey, we're in summer is in full swing now, and so we got people leaving and other people coming, and so uh, make sure you get to know some of the new folks that are here today. Um, and what's nice about summertime is that they, while well, some people go, other people come and visit. So. We can meet some new people. We're going through the book of John, the Gospel of John right now. We're up to chapter 7, and it's uh, the story today, or the, the narrative is going to take us to from verse 14 over to verse 24. And it's a story now where Jesus is carrying on a dialogue with a bunch of people with a crowd of people he's kind of like you know he's getting heckled while he's teaching and people are asking him questions and things like that it's it's kind of it's it's not like Jesus normally like we normally see him you know he'll be talking to the Jewish leaders or something like that taking questions answering questions but here he's like talking to this whole crowd of Jews who um, really kind of get a little bit rowdy they, they kind of mock Jesus a little bit. Um, so I'm going to read the passage and then we can uh, dig into dig into it each, each verse. So it's going to be John chapter 7 verses 14 to 24. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered, You have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. May God add his blessing to the reading of this, his holy word. Let's pray. Father, you uh, bring us together each Lord's Day in order to learn from you, to read your word and to get into the meaning of it. Not to look on outward appearance, but to, to really dig into what it really means for us. I pray that you would apply, and that the Holy Spirit would apply these truths that are in your word to each of our hearts today and change us in ways that will recognize as we go through our lives going forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So he ends this, this uh, what he was saying with, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. And I think that sums up this whole passage. In fact, it may even sum up several chapters of John that we've been reading up until now. Judging by appearances versus making correct judgment. So when you think about it, what was Jesus seen as? Who, who was Jesus? And how did people perceive him to be uh, in this book? And especially, as we saw last week, how did Jesus' brothers even see him? Remember, his brothers told him, stop hanging out here in the country. You should go into the city 
go to Judea where there are a lot more people and you can do your miracles and become famous if you go to Jerusalem and Judea. Well, most people saw him as this Jewish man who was walking around and doing miracles and, and signs and wonders and things. Even in chapter 3, all the way back in chapter 3, Nicodemus, one of the Jewish leaders, said that he had the power of God. And throughout the chapters 4, 5, and 6, we see Jesus going into places and doing miracles. He was multiplying food and feeding people. He was healing people who were, had long-term diseases. He was raising people from the dead. He, had, he was doing all these miracles and walking on the surface of the water in the Sea of Galilee. I mean, he was doing all these things. But many of those who were witnessing the miracles and were even a part of the miracles when they were eating the food that he made, many of them uh, found that what he said was unacceptable. What he was doing was great. They liked the miracles. But what he was saying, his words, were hard. They wanted to see the miracles. They wanted to experience that. But they, they just couldn't accept Jesus' words. At the end of chapter 6, Jesus even asks his 12 disciples, the ones who were closest to him, if they wanted to leave as well, because people were just leaving in droves because of what he said. And remember their answer. They said, where shall we go? Uh, you have the words, not the works, you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So most people were just not t paying attention to his words. They didn't like them, but his disciples were saying, yes, if you would listen to them and believe them, then you realize that Jesus is the Son of God, the Holy One of God. And they came to know this by his words, not by his works. So don't miss this. Even if you believe in the miracles... And even if, you're, if you love the miracles that Jesus performed then and things that can be, you know, people getting healed here and now and, and different signs and wonders that are being shown today, if you don't believe his words, trust in him, then you don't have salvation. You don't have the words of eternal life. His words are the words of eternal life. And believing them and trusting in him, in him is the way to salvation. So last week we were in uh, chapter 7 and verse 5, and it said, not even his brothers believed in him. These are the guys who were telling him, go to Judea and let people see the works that you're doing. Because they didn't even believe in him. Jesus, you seriously need to be able to market your stuff so that you can become famous. And Jesus says, no, you don't, you don't get it. And the world doesn't get it either. When I get through, the world is going to want to kill me instead. Because I, he, the, last week he said, I testify that the works of the world are evil. And so you guys can go up to the feast. You guys go and, and enjoy yourselves. But I'm going to wait for the right time. And that was last week's message. But this week... Jesus did go up to the festival. Now, this festival that they're talking about is the Feast of Booths. This is a feast where the Jews would build tents and go camping for a week. So they had like the week with two Sabbaths on either end of the week where they would uh, be camping out. They would be in tents. And this was, in, in, uh, was to remind them that when God... Uh, took them out of Egypt when he rescued them from slavery in Egypt that they had to live in tents for 40 years they lived out in the wilderness in tents and so this is, this is supposed to remind them that they were once a tent people now they didn't just use it this time to live in tents as you might imagine you get that many Jewish people together and, and all the Jewish 
males were required to come to Jerusalem to do this, this festival. So they didn't just let them live out in, in their tents. What they did is they brought them into the temple and taught. So there was a lot of teaching going on. Um, it was for preaching and teaching. The rabbis would hold classes, like they would take a part of the courtyard of the temple, and there you know, would be one rabbi teaching a whole bunch of people. And so um, around the middle of the week, it says, Jesus, about like the fourth or fifth day of this feast of tents and booths, about the middle of the week, he came and he found his own spot for teaching. And chances are he drew, drew a big crowd because people were looking for him. You know, in the previous chapters we saw people were really after Jesus because of what he was doing and what he was saying. So he found his own place. And it says in verse 15, the Jews marveled. And not just at his teaching, but the fact that Jesus, they said, he never studied. How did they know that? Well, at that time, the Jewish boys who were showing promise, or maybe they just had, you know, they were just more fortunate by birth, they were taken aside and they were taught in these rabbis' schools. Um, rather than go out and work in the fields and be, you know, agriculture uh, people, that they would take them aside and they would put them in the rabbis' schools, and that's where they would study. We, we, we saw this when we studied the book of Acts. And in Acts 22, Paul tells about himself. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, meaning in Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, etc. So Paul was bragging that he had learned at the feet of this rabbi whose name was Gamaliel. And he was a very uh, famous, very uh, prominent rabbi that taught a lot of the Jewish boys. And he even says that he lived in Jerusalem during that time. Even though he was from Tarsus, which is to the northeast, he lived in Jerusalem so that he could study under Gamaliel. And so the Jews marveled, not just because of Jesus' teaching, but because he had never studied, meaning he had never been in one of those rabbis' schools that they knew all about. He, he had, as far as they knew, he had never been in the schools. And Jesus' teaching was beyond anything that anybody had ever heard. Rabbis would stand around, and they, and they would stand around the temple and talk about the scriptures and explain the scriptures and quote other rabbis to validate their own views. But Jesus, Jesus showed a level of wisdom and knowledge and understanding that was, that was unequaled among the rabbis. And the Jews were shocked. It says they marveled at this flawless instruction which they'd never heard before. He doesn't validate his teaching by any other human source. They've never seen anything like it. So they wanted to be able to discredit him somehow. And so they picked the way to do it, which is to not attack his teaching, but attack him personally. They've never heard anything like, how are they going to discredit him? They attack him. Verse 15, how is it this, this man has learning, but he has never studied? You see, they're looking at the outward appearance of Jesus. We've never, where's his degree from anyway? Where did he get his schooling? How can we believe that he's telling us the right thing when he doesn't quote any other rabbis? He's, how do we know? It's an outward focus. It's looking at the, the surface, looking at the outside and all of the outside appearances. And so Jesus replies, and, and this is what is kind of unique about this situation because he replies to the crowd and he, he answers their question. A lot of times Jesus would answer a question with a question. This time he just comes out and answers it directly. And he says, uh, my teaching is not mine, 
but his who sent me. The source of Jesus' teaching is not men or even himself, but the one who sent me. And he's talking about God because God sent him. But Jesus had been claiming this all along. If you read you know, earlier in John in chapter 5, verse 19, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of God can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. And later in that chapter, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is a constant theme of Jesus. He is doing God's will, not his own. Chapter 8, verse 26, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. And then finally in John 17, Jesus is speaking to the Father, and he says, For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So you see, when people believe, then they can understand that, that God is the one who sent him and who has given him these words. But he answers that outwardly focused question about where the teaching comes from because he wants to answer a different question that they aren't asking. They didn't ask, how can we tell if what this man is saying is true? Verse 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. How do we know if Jesus' words, his teachings, are true? Jesus gave us the test. If the hearer's were, uh, will is the same as God's will, then you'll be able to discern whether there's truth there or not. If anyone's will is to do God's will. In other words, if your will, you're listening, if your will is in alignment with God's, then you will know if the teaching that you're hearing is from God. So somehow there's a relationship between this willing and knowing. With the alignment of God's will with our own, and the ability to discern God's truth from someone who might be speaking on their own authority. So how does that work? Normally we think, well, um, if I learn more, then I'll believe more. If I learn and get to know more things, if I gain knowledge, then eventually my will will be to do God's will. But what Jesus is saying is opposite that. He says, your will has to be in alignment first, and then you will know things. How, is this, how does this happen? How is our will aligned with God's will? When we submit to God's will, then that's when we will be in, in alignment with God's will. We're always saying this, right, in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus in the garden said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What he's saying is truth. What he's saying is that this truth is not an intellectual exercise. You don't just need to gain knowledge. The foundation for finding the truth is having your will aligned with God's will. And that happens when God changes your heart, when God transforms your heart, takes out the heart of stone and puts in the heart of flesh. This is where salvation begins. The Holy Spirit convicts a person of their, of their sin, and that sinner becomes weary and of carrying this burden around, this burden of sin. And they become a seeker, and they begin to, to see that God's will is different than their own will. They're not aligned. Now, without God's intervention, our wills would stay out of alignment with God's will. We want what we want. And God wants what, what he wants. We don't want what God wants. But when our will, our desire, our passions are all in sync 
with God's, then we will see Jesus for who he is, God's son. We'll be able to discern the truth that he's teaching, and we'll see his teaching as the truth. Jesus is asking the Jews first to check their hearts. That's what you need to do. Check your hearts, their wills, to see if they are in sync with God. And if they are, then they'll be able to discern the truth for themselves. So this becomes for us a general truth that we can know. If you want to test the source of someone's teaching, then first submit your will to God's will. If you want to learn from the Bible, if you want to learn from your, your reading of God's word, check and make sure that your will is aligned with God's will. Are you seeking God's will or just listening on the surface? Where did he get his degree? Who's telling him all these things? But then in verse 18, Jesus gets really specific about what the matter is at hand. He says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Whose glory is the speaker seeking? We have to ask this ourselves as preachers, people who stand before others and, and expound the word of God. Am I seeking my own glory or am I seeking to glorify God? Because the only way to be true is to glorify God and not be seeking our own glory. Was Jesus seeking his own glory or was he seeking to glorify God? Well. Jesus obviously was seeking to glorify God because Jesus is responding in humility to those who are testing whether or not he's speaking the truth. I mean, he is God after all. But they're questioning him. Where did you get this teaching? How do you know all this? He's, he had to humble himself. He had to teach in humility because they were... They were not being humble with him. They were trying to discredit him. In John 5, chapter, uh, verse 44, it says, How can you believe, Jesus speaking to the leaders, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Those... Jewish leaders were seeking their own glory when they were expounding, and when they were talking about the scriptures, when they were citing other earthly human uh, rabbis who supported them. What Jesus is pointing out to these Jewish leaders is that they didn't seek the glory of God. They sought glory from one another. They were more interested in the praise of men than in the praise of God. So, so far we have Jesus asserting that his teaching is divine truth and you would know that if your will was aligned with God's will and that the mark of a truth teller is that he doesn't seek his own glory but rather the glory of the one who sent him and then Jesus turns it around and he asks the crowd a question and it seems to come out of left field Verse 19, has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keep the law? Why do you seek to kill me? Now, it seems like it comes out of left field until you remember the context. If you think about, this is the first time that Jesus has been back in Jerusalem after he had been there for the previous Passover. So after that Passover, he went to Galilee. He stayed there and taught and did miracles and all that, and then he came back to Jerusalem for this Feast of Booths. And so this is the first time that he's back in Jerusalem, and you remember what happened at that last Passover. We studied it. There was a man who had been crippled for 38 years sitting beside a pool in Bethesda, which was inside Jerusalem. It was this pool where there was supposed to be special healings that would occur. And Jesus, of course, healed the man, and he did it on the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders were really mad about him doing work 
on the Sabbath, not according to their rules, but because Jesus, knowing what the true Sabbath was about, did a healing that day. This is another example, a clear example of concentrating on the externals rather than seeing through to the meaning of that event. He did this wonderful thing for a man who had suffered for much of his life and, and all the Jewish leaders could see was that he did it on the Sabbath. He broke their version of those Sabbath laws, the code of, of conduct that they had created. So he uses that event, he goes back to that event because the people around him are going to remember that and he uses that as, an, as a, a symbol of all of his deeds. Remember, nobody denied that Jesus actually did these miracles. Nobody denied that he healed the man. Nobody denied that he multiplied food. That's not what they were, that's not what they were worried about. They knew that it happened, but they also knew that it happened on their Sabbath. And so he's saying, I'm a truth teller. I do it all for God's glory. And you would know that my teaching is divine truth if you were in sync with God's will. And they had demonstrated they're not in sync with God's will because they had all these rules about the Sabbath that didn't make any sense if you were looking at it from God's perspective. So he's, he sees all these ways that they're being externally focused. And this was a prime example. Remember that crippled man? I healed him and, and you guys just wanted to chop off my head. And so... What is the crowd's response? The crowd answers Jesus, I think really disingenuous. He says, they say, oh, you're sick in the head, right? Who's trying to kill you? You're not only uh, possessed by a demon, but you're paranoid on top of it. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't out to get you. But Jesus explains, well, in in the law that Moses gave, you're required to circumcise a baby boy on the eighth day of his life. That was, that was the circumcision that Moses talked about in his law. And so you're, you're required to do that. What happens if the eighth day happens to fall on the Sabbath? You guys circumcise him anyway. You're breaking one law in order to obey a different law. So whose law is the one that we should that should be followed. Which one? And in verse 23, he reveals the crux of his, of his uh, argument. He says, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? You do the circumcision on the Sabbath so that the higher law, the law of Moses, will not be broken because you know that your Sabbath code of conduct is just, is just made up. It's just a restriction that you place on the people. So there are exceptions to your Sabbath law, right? And now, why doesn't the same exception apply to healing a man's whole body that applies to simply doing a circumcision? He says, I did this one miracle and, and you want to kill me. One miracle that was done on the Sabbath, which was a greater expression of goodness and divine mercy and divine power than any of your made-up codes of behavior on the Sabbath, and you want to kill me for that when you yourselves violate your own ordinances because you think circ circumcision is more important than to, to follow Moses' law. This is simple hypocrisy. They, they can't see that they're doing the same thing as, as Jesus. If, if their laws are correct, then they're breaking their own laws. And Jesus points it out, points out their hypocrisy, and he's arguing from the small to the great, like performing a small thing like a circumcision to making a man's whole body well. If the small one is a good exception, then why wouldn't the larger one be as well? And so we get to verse 24. 
which I talked about in the beginning as well. It sums up the whole passage. Uh, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Don't use your five senses to make your judgments. These Jews are looking at the law outwardly and missing the deeper meaning of the law. What Jesus is saying is that at the heart of the law is this idea that human beings exist for the glory of God and should have wills that love to live for the glory of God and not for the glory of men. But instead, the Jews have made the law itself a servant of their own self-exaltation, their own lack of God-exalting exaltation. They and we can't really know Jesus and know that his teaching is from God until our will is in alignment with God's will. Okay, so how is this going to change us? What are we going to do with this knowledge? First, if you've been checking this out for this whole Christian thing for a while and you're still not sure, you're in the right place. The founder of Grassroots Church and our good friend Ash used to say, if you want to hitch a ride into town, don't stand in the jungle with your thumb out. You have to go to the road where the cars are that's where you might have a chance of getting picked up. And here in this place, it's a good chance that you'll get picked up and get a ride into town right here because this is where you're going to be learning. You're going to be um, listening to God's words, singing God's songs, being with God's people. It's a good place to be. It's the equivalent of hitching a, uh, a ride by the side of the road as opposed to in the jungle. Jesus is revealing himself to you and to all of us in these passages. Do you desire to do God's will instead of your own? Do you see where doing your own will has gotten you all these years? Do you see the world being full of hypocrisy but when your will is to do God's will you see into the heart of the matter rather than always looking on the surface at the outward appearance. Pray that God will give you the gift of a new heart and a new will that wants to glorify him. If you know you're redeemed, you've turned from your sin, you've trusted in Jesus Christ, but feel deficient in the area of glorifying God, which I do all the time, you feel deficient, then as Jesus said in verse 18, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks God's glory is true. If you don't feel like you've always seek God's glory above your own, then you can ask him to change you. There are things you can do to increase your appetite for glorifying God. If you wanted to increase your appetite for, say, oh, I don't know, classical music, let's say. You would study it. You would listen to more classical music. You would talk to people who love classical music. You'd want to learn more about that. Well, if you want to learn more about glorifying God, you can do the same. You can study God's word, not so that you can learn more, but so that you can see in his word what his will is and then conform your will to his. Because that's what Jesus says. When you conform your will to God's will, then, then the, the scriptures will be open to you. The truth will be, uh, will be um, the truth will come alive to you. So spending more time in his word, not just for the head knowledge, but seeking to conform your will to his. Being aware of his presence, acknowledging his presence throughout the day, as you go through your day. Acknowledging his presence, seeing God's presence in little things that happen so that you are praying without ceasing, as Paul tells us to do. Look for ways to apply the gospel. The gospel that God showed you mercy by sending his son to die for you in your place for your sin and applying that to everyday life. Applying that to the people that you meet. Applying it to your family and friends and then sharing that gospel with others that you care about so that you 
are, are living out that gospel message. Now in a minute we're going to be, we can respond by singing and by um, co- having communion with our Savior. As Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have an opportunity to serve our God, to conform our will to his, and in doing so, to be able to discern the truth of his word and to be able to discern how he wants us to live and what he wants us to do to glorify him. Let's pray. Father, your word tells us that if we would know the truth, then we would conform our wills to yours. That the knowledge isn't the point. It's, it's having our wills align with your will. And when we do that, then we can discern the truth. We can gain that knowledge that we need. And in all things will be aligned with your will. Father, help us now to apply that to our lives. Holy Spirit, come and illuminate these words so that we may understand more and more and in doing so, bring greater glory to the Father. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.